Hey everyone, welcome back to trigonometry. This will be lecture 13 of the course. And in this section, we're going to get into uh, trigonometric equations. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into that. This will be, we're going to call this section 3.5 uh, trigonometric equations. And I mean, as the name implies, you know, uh, a trigonometric equation is basically just an equation that contains a trigonometric function or a, com a collection of trigonometric functions uh, with variables, right? So a couple of examples would be like, <clears throat> a simple example would be like sine of x equals one half. All right, slightly more complicated example would be cosine of x plus sine of x equals the square root of 2 over 2. All right, these are just a couple of examples. Um, these are what you would call trig equations. All right, the key thing is that the variable be inside of the trigonometric function or functions. All right, so an example like this, if we were to say x plus sine of pi over 2 equals 0. This is not a trigonometric equation. I mean, it does have a trig function in it, but the variable is not inside of the trig function. Right? So here, really, this is just a constant value, isn't it? Right? We could just go look up what the sine of pi over 2 is, or we could remember that it's 1. Right? So this is a constant value. Right? So this is not a trig equation. Okay, so hopefully that difference is clear. If the variable is inside the trig function, then you got a trigonometric equation. If the variable is not inside the trig function, then you just have a regular equation, but with a goofy way of writing a constant, right? This is just kind of a silly way of writing the number one, right? Well, not a silly way, it's just not a very effective, efficient way. Okay, so <clears throat> trigonometric equations <clears throat> will usually have lots and lots of solutions, usually. Okay, so trig equations will usually have lots, and I say lots and I typically mean infinitely many, solutions. Okay, and so as an example, let's uh, Let's plot the sine function here real quick and take a look at something. All right, so let's say I've got my sine function, and we'll say uh, you know this is negative one and that's positive one. <clears throat> so we know the sine function starts down here. Well, I better mark off some spots here. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, and maybe we'll go this direction as well. Okay, so the sine function starts at zero and goes up to one, then back to zero, then down to one and then back to zero. So it kind of goes like this. All right, we know that that's what it looks like. And then the same thing over here, All right? It's gonna come down and so on. And so remember our example from up above where we said uh, sine of x equals one half. Well, we know that one half is right about here. And so here's a solution, there's a solution, there's a solution there's a solution, right? So anywhere that the trig function crosses the line, y equals one half, uh, is going to be a solution to this trig equation, right? And so there's going to be infinitely many solutions, okay? So keeping that in mind, we'll typically what we'll end up doing is saying we're interested in the solutions within a particular range. Like we might say things like find all the solutions to sine of x equals one half uh, that lie between theta equals zero and theta equals two pi. Okay, and so that would be like basically this range, right? So this is zero here, and this would be like pi over 2, this would be pi, this would be 3 pi over 2, this would be 2 pi, right? And so the solutions in that interval would be here, 
here, and well, that's it actually, just those two. Okay, and so these are actually pi over six, and this is five pi over six. Okay, so the solutions in this case, pi over six and five pi over six. Okay, and just like any, any algebraic equation, a trig equation, when we say solution, we just mean a value which, when we substitute it into the variable, produces a true statement. <clears throat> so it's just the normal interpretation there. Okay. Okay, very good. <clears throat> and so that is, in short, what a trig equation's that's, that's what they are, that's what they look like, and that's just a word or two on what, um, what you can expect for, for the solutions of a trigonometric equation. Right? Namely, you'll expect a lot of them, and so you'll want to limit the uh, range for which you're going to hunt. Right? So you might limit yourself to just the solutions that lie between 0 and 2 pi, for example. It's very common. Okay, so what we want to do with the rest of the of the lecture is just go through a bunch of examples. And we're just going to kind of start with the simpler examples and we'll move up to some of the more, more advanced examples. Okay, and so we want to start with equations involving a single trig expression. So equations uh, involving a single trig expression or function. Okay, so that's kind of the first example. And so the basic approach here is going to be isolate the trig function and solve for the variable. Right, so kind of a two-step or isolate the trig function and solve for the variable. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's say we want to solve uh, 3 sine of x minus 2 equals 5 sine of x minus 1. Okay, and so basically the step one here is to isolate the trig function. All that really means is get the trig function sine of x together by itself on one side. So you can see you've actually got two terms that include the sine of x. So you have to kind of, you have to do your basic sort of algebra techniques here. Right, so I'll move the five sine of x over to this side. Right? And so I can say I've got three sine of x minus two, and then I move the five sine of x over. So I have minus five sine of x and then equals negative 1. All right now maybe I want to move the negative 2 over this side and so I have 3 sine of x minus 5 sine of x equals negative 1 plus 2. Okay. And at this point I can start to combine terms like these are like terms aren't they? 3 times the sine of x and minus 5 times the sine of x. You can just think of that as 3x minus 5x. You know how you would combine those, so you combine these in the same way. And so this is actually negative 2 sine of x. Okay, and then over here, obviously, I've got negative 1 plus 2 is just equal to 1. Okay, and so then that means I've got sine of x equals negative 1 half when I divide by 2. <clears throat> okay, and so now we're at a situation where we, uh, you know, we need to know the angle x where sine is equal to negative one half. Okay, and so what we could do is we could use the unit circle at this point. So we want to use the unit circle to find out where uh, sine of x is equal to negative one half, right? So we can just go look. And I've got the unit circle here. And so remember, sine is the second component. So we've got one of them here at 7 pi over 6. And we've also got one over here at 11 pi over 6. Okay. And so we can see that 
sine of x is equal to negative one half when x equals uh, five, seven pi over six and 11 pi over six, right, those two, okay? <clears throat> now, technically, this example did not say, hey, we're just interested in the solutions between zero and two pi. So what we have to do is figure out a way to, uh, you know, capture all of the infinitely many solutions. And so just looking back at the unit circle here, we know that we're going to have a solution every for every angle that has a terminal side here at 7 pi over 6. And so that's going to be 7 pi over 6, but it's also going to be 7 pi over 6 plus another 2 pi, right? And then it's going to be 7 pi over 6 plus another 4 pi, and then another 6 pi, and another 8 pi, right? And so one way to write this solution would be to say x equals 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi times n, right? Where n is, sorry, n is any integer, right? So if I plug in a 1, then it's 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi. If I plug in a 2, then it's 7 pi over 6 plus 4 pi. If I plug in a 3, you get the plus 6 pi and then the plus 8 pi and so on. You also get the negative angles this way. Right, So that's one way to, to encode this solution. The other one is the same idea, x equals 11 pi over 6. Now, just like the 7 pi over 6 solution, right? if I start here and I go around to 11 pi over 6, then sine is equal to negative 1 half there. But I can go another 2 pi, and I, st and I have sine back at negative 1 half again. I can go 4 pi, I can go... 6 pi, 8 pi, however many times I need to go around the circle, but as long as my terminal side lands in this position, then the sine is negative 1 half. And so in the same way, this solution here, you can capture all of the infinitely many versions of it by writing plus 2 pi times n. Again, where n is any integer. Okay. Right, when n is equal to zero, then that's the base solution, 11 pi over six. When n is equal to one, it's 11 pi over six plus two pi, et cetera, right? All right, so here's the best way to write the solution to this trigonometric equation. Okay, all right, very good. Let's uh, do another example. Let's do an example where we have an equation involving multiple angles. This is another common variation you'll see. So equations involving multiple angles. Okay, let's see what that means in a second here. So here's an example. Say we want to solve tangent of 3x equals 1. And here we're interested in just the x's that are between 0 and 2 pi. Okay. So what you want to do, <clears throat> the way you want to approach a problem like this, is you just want to think of this as tangent of x equals 1 to start with. So you want to think first of this as tan x equals 1, so kind of the normal one, okay? Okay, and so if we if we do that, if we think if we think of tangent of x equals 1, then it doesn't take us long to find where on the unit circle tangent of x is equal to 1, right? We can look here, and we can see that the tangent is 1 right here, right? It's also 1 over here, Right, so you've got the tangent at 5 pi over 4 also, right? But let's just think about the pi over 4 example first, okay? So the tangent of x is equal to 1 when x is equal to pi over 4, okay? And so we can write, uh, given this, we can use the same technique as the previous example to write the infinitely many examples, right? And so 
we could say when x is equal to pi over 4 plus 2 pi. But actually notice here that you get pi over 4 and you actually only have to go a half circle until you get tangent equal to 1 again. Right? You see that? If I'm here on this line here, pi over 4, and I go a full pi, that's 4 pi over 4, I get to 5 pi over 4. And I've got a tangent equal to 1 here as well. So it's really pi over 4 plus <clears throat> pi times n. Okay, that's the better way to think about it. Okay, so when x is equal to pi over 4 plus pi times n, write it like that, where n is any integer. Okay, and so we've solved this one, but now notice that what we're actually interested in is 3x inside here. So here's where the kind of tricky novel item for this particular type comes in. Right? Instead of x equaling pi over 4 plus pi n, we have to write, we basically need to solve a, a, a separate equation secondarily. Instead of x, it's 3x. So we need to solve for x when uh, we set this solution equal to 3x. So 3x equals pi over 4 plus pi times n. Right, so we actually have to solve that one. And so that's going to change things a little bit, right? If I start with 3x equals pi over 4 plus pi n, then I divide both sides by 3, and I get x equals, I'll write it like this first, 1 third times pi over 4 plus pi n. Right, and I can simplify that further. I get x equals, and this would be pi over 3 times 4, so that's pi over 12. And this would be pi n over 3. Okay. <clears throat> and so that's going to, this is the full solution space. This is the full solution set for tangent of 3x equals 1, okay? This guy here. Now, <clears throat> this problem is extra tricky because not only does it have a multiple angle in here, but it also asks you to limit the solution space to just those that are between 0 and 2 pi, okay? And so we need to figure out which subset of this is falls in that range. So that's just as simple as testing. Right? What happens if for n equals 0? Then I get x equals pi over 12 plus pi over, well, pi times 0 over 3. Well, that's just pi over 12, right? So that one's in. That's between 0 and 2 pi. What about n equals 1? x, e sorry, x equals pi over 12 plus pi over 3. And so that's like 4 pi over 12, and so I get 5 pi over 12. And that one's in also. Okay, and I can keep going like this. Let's do another one, n equals 2. I get x equals pi over 12 plus pi times 2 over 3, so that'd be 2 pi over 3. Okay, and that one is, well, what's that when I add that all up, I get 8, 9 pi over 12, so that would be 3 pi over 4. That one is in. All right, and I can keep going like this. And let's say n equals 5. I know I'm skipping a couple here. <clears throat> and so when I do n equals 5, I get x equals pi over 12 plus 5 pi over 3. And when I add all of that together, that gives me 7 pi over 4. So it'd be like 21 pi over 12, right? If you kind of do the math there. And then that one is in also. And now notice what happens when I get to n equals 6. I get x equals pi over 12 plus 6 pi over 3. Okay, now when I add these together, this is basically like 24 pi plus 1 pi over 12. So I get 25 pi over 12. Okay, now this here is too big. 
this is greater than 2 pi. Right? So that means the n equals 6 solution is out. So really the solutions are n equals 0 through n equals 5. So, so the solutions are x equals pi over 12 plus pi n over 3 for n equals 0, 1, 2 through 5. That's the that's the solution set uh, that uh, solves this equation here within this range. Okay. All right. So that's kind of a kind of a tricky one. All right. Um, another type of problem that you'll see with trigonometric equations is the trigonometric equations that are in quadratic form. So trig equations uh, quadratic in form. Okay, we'll see what this looks like. So um, we, let's review a, a couple of items from algebra that we'll need to solve these types of equations, right? So the key thing here that we need is we need to know how to factor a quadratic equation. So quadratic factoring. Okay, this is a review. So you'll probably have seen this, <clears throat> um, but you know, maybe not, maybe not for a while. So factoring ax squared plus bx plus c is easy when a is equal to 1. Okay. All right, so when a is equal to 1, we're basically looking for two numbers, x and y, such that, uh, well, when a is equal to 1, we need to find two numbers x and y such that x times y equals c equals this guy and x plus y equals b this guy okay and once we find those two numbers we can uh, we can figure out how to fact how the factory works let's do an example Do a quick example here. So we say we want to factor uh, x squared plus 6x plus 8. Okay. So notice that your xy, x times y, because we're trying to match up this 8, you can use 8 times 1 or 2 times 4, basically. All right? 8 times 1 is 8, 2 times 4 is 8. Okay. But what about our x plus y? I need two numbers which simultaneous, I need an x and a y that does this, but also adds together to be six. So eight plus one is not six, but two plus four is. Okay, so these are, this, these are the numbers I need. Okay, and so what I can do is I can say, okay, x squared plus six x plus eight is equal to x plus two times x plus four. I can take those two numbers, plop them in here, right? Then when I do the FOIL method on this, I'll get this equation back, right? So this is quadratic factoring. Okay, one more example, just to make sure we've got this concept down. Let's say I wanna factor uh, x squared plus 13x plus 40, right? So my xy, well, I need something that equals 40. I could do 20 times 2. I could do 10 times 4. I could do 5 times 8. There's lots of options, aren't there? Lots of lots of things that I can multiply together to get 40. Um, but I also need something that adds together to give me 13. Right? 20 times 2. 20 plus 2 is 22. 10 plus 4 is 14. Too big. 5 plus 8, though, works, right? So 5 times 8, this is multiplication, and 5 plus 8. And so that means this, this equation here, k 
can be factored into x plus 5 and x plus 8. Right, again, when I FOIL these together, let's do it quick. x times x is x squared. x times 8 is 8x. 5 times x is 5x. And 5 times 8 is 40. Right, and so I get x squared plus 13x plus 40. Right, that's obviously what I have up here. Okay, and so that's how the factoring works. Right, so hopefully, hopefully that is uh, something you've seen and you can kind of remember how that works. Um, factoring becomes somewhat more complex when when you know you have a slightly different setup. Factoring ax squared plus bx plus c is <clears throat> slightly more challenging when a is not equal to 1 and slightly more challenging when a is not equal to 1. So in particular uh, we'll use x plus y equals b to identify the second term in each factor but these will have to be checked against our choices of our first term. Okay, and so let's do an example and you can kind of see what I'm what I mean here. So uh, let's say we want to factor 8x squared minus 10x minus 3. So kind of the first step would be to find two first terms. whose product is this 8x squared. Okay, and so kind of think of it like this. Uh, you could do 8x and x, or you could do 4x and 2x. Okay, those are kind of the best two options, really. And then what you want to do, second step, is to find the last term whose product is negative 3. Right, so you're looking for this one. Find the last term, terms, whose product is negative 3. Okay, so basically I need two numbers that multiply together to give me negative 3. So that'd be like negative 1 and... 3 or uh, you know or 1 and negative 3 right those are pretty much our only options there okay and then we need to try various combinations try various combinations of these factors Right, so for example, maybe I'll go with the 4x and the 2x. So 4x plus 1 and 2x minus 3, for example. Another variation would be like uh, the 4x minus 3 and the 2x plus 1. Right, And then <clears throat> you just have to kind of do some trial and error here. Right, so some trial and error will get you the answer. Right, and it actually turns out that this one here is the one you want. Right, this is the one you want. Right, and you can see that this, this is going to give you the 8x squared minus 10x minus 3, right, because you've got two. 4x times 2x gets you 8x squared, and then you've got uh, 4x times negative 3 gets you, that's minus 12x, and then plus 2x, and then minus 3. And so you've got 8x squared minus 10x minus 3, right? So this is the answer. Okay. All right. And so. 
sometimes our trig equations will have a quadratic form and in these cases we can use factoring and you know the zero product method to solve the equations so let's see an example here how this might work out okay so say we want to solve uh, 2 cos squared x plus cos x minus 1 equals 0. And say we want to do this for uh, 0 less than or equal to x less than 2 pi. Okay, so <clears throat> the idea here is to just kind of be able to notice this form, right? You've got the cosine function squared plus the cosine function not squared. Right, so note if we set u equal to cos x, then we can rewrite this as basically a quadratic equation. <clears throat> we can rewrite this as basically 2 times u squared plus u minus 1 equals 0. You get this guy right here. Right, and then some some effort uh, could be you know you could you could spend some time trying to factor this, and what you'll find is that this is actually factorable, and it factors nicely into two u minus one times u plus one. Okay, and so you've got basically this quadratic equation that factors into these two pieces, right? And so what does this mean? Well, this means that the original trig equation can be written as 2 cos x minus 1 times cos x plus 1 equals 0. Okay, And so it, I think if you recall when you have um, when you're looking for zeros of quadratic equations you can basically set this side equal to zero and figure out what u needs to be and then separately set this piece here equal to zero and figure out what u needs to be. And so you do the same thing with the trig equations. And so you would say, look, you wanna look at both factors separately. So looking at both factors separately, all right, we'll start with this side. We've got two times cosine of x minus 1 equals 0 and so I can do a little rearranging on this and so if I add 1 and divide by 2 I see that this is actually cos x equals 1 half isn't it right and so I could quickly go out to my unit circle and I can see that the cosine is equal to 1 half here at pi over 6 oh sorry uh, at, up here at pi over 3 pi over 3 and then also at uh, 5 pi over 3. Oh, there, down here. Yep. All right, so I've got cosine was 1 half here and also up here. Okay, and there's no other place between 0 and 2 pi where cosine is 1 half. Okay, and so I can say uh, x is equal to pi over 3 or. 5 pi over 3. All right, and that takes care of this side. The other side would be this one, cos x plus 1 equals 0. And so this is just cosine of x equals negative 1. And when does that happen? Where does that occur? Well, cosine of x is equal to negative 1 over here at pi, isn't it? Yeah, you can see that right there. And so this happens when x is equal to pi. Okay, so the solutions are pi over 3, pi, and 5 pi over 3. Okay, so kind of a clever way to approach a problem like this. Let's do another one of those. Let's say we want to solve uh, 4 sine squared x minus 1 equals 0. And again, uh, 0 less than or equal to x less than 2 pi, right? So just the first solutions. Okay, so we could just do some algebra on this. <clears throat> 
uh, we could say 4 sine squared x minus 1 equals 0. So <clears throat> we can kind of solve this for uh, the sine squared. Let's get the 1 out of there and then divide by 4. So that means sine squared x is equal to 1 over 4, right? So adding 1 to both sides and then dividing both sides by 4, you get this. Now, uh, technically, <clears throat> we can see that this is going to be e this can be solved without even this is quadratic in form but we don't actually have to factor here right we can just take the square root of both sides and we get the sine of x is equal to plus or minus the square root of one fourth which is plus or minus one half okay so so this expression uh, this equation is going to have solutions where is going to be satisfied when sine of x is equal to one half and it's also going to be satisfied when sine of x is equal to negative one half so we have to check both sides and figure out where that occurs so sine of x equals one half when does that happen I'm looking at the unit circle again so you get that at pi over six right here and you also get it at 5 pi over 6, is that right? Yep, right, 1 half there as well. Okay, so this one happens when x is equal to 5 pi over 6 and pi over 6. What about the negative 1 half? When does that happen? Well, that happens, uh, you can see, so here's a 1 half and there's a 1 half. We've got another one down here. That's the negative one half, and then you got the negative one half over here as well. So that's going to happen at seven pi over six and eleven pi over six. Okay. So this happens when x is seven pi over six and eleven pi over six, right? So the solutions are x equals pi over six, five pi over six. 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. Okay. All right, so there's like a, a couple of different ways to, to think about that. Okay. Perfect. Um, sometimes a trig equation will involve a handful of different trig function types like cosine and sine for example or tr or tangent and sine or whatever tangent cosine and sine and in order to solve it we have we may need to resort to the use of trigonometric identities so this is the third kind of or a fourth kind of way that you can try to solve these things so using identities to solve trig equations So an example there would be something like this. Solve 2 cos squared x plus 3 sine x equals 0. Right, and we're just interested in where x is between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, and so let's see what we can do here. So 2 cos squared x plus 3 sine x equals zero. Let's do a little bit of algebra to this. So instead of cos squared x, I'm going to plug in, I'm going to use the Pythagorean identity. So remember, cos squared x plus sine squared x equals one. Okay, and so instead of cos, I'm going to plug in one minus sine squared x. So I get two times one minus sine squared x. Right, just substituting here and then plus 3 sine x equals 0 okay so that's just the the point of doing that is just that now everything is in terms of sine right so all of the trig functions are the same and so then I can do a little bit of work to this and I get 2 minus 2 sine squared x plus 3 sine x equals 0 and so I can rewrite this and get this into quadratic form real easily. So I've got uh, negative 2 sine squared x plus 3 
sine x plus 2 equals 0. And I'm going to divide everything by a negative just so I can make this a positive here. So I'm going to write that as 2 sine squared x minus 3 sine x minus 2 equals 0. Okay. It just makes the arithmetic when I'm trying to factor this thing a little more straightforward. And, and so you'll notice here that this has the quadratic form. Right, so if u is equal to sine of x, then this is 2u squared minus 3u minus 2 equals 0. Okay, and then really to solve this, all we really need to do is we need to factor. We need to factor this part of the expression. Okay, and so we kind of just talk through how, to, how that factoring works. It's a little bit of trial and error. So I think in the interest of time, I'll just give you the answer here and tell you that this can be factored into 2u plus 1 times u minus 2. Okay, so you can factor that out. And that implies that this is really 2 sine of x plus 1 times sine of x minus 2. Okay, and so just like before, when we were looking at the example where we've kind of factored into these into these two parts, we need to consider each of these separately, right? So first we'll we'll look at the two sine of x plus one equals zero part. So this piece here needs to equal zero, or that piece needs to equal zero, or both of them. So we'll start with this one, okay? And so this again, we could just like rearrange this, and we see that sine of x is equal to negative 1, that would go over there, and then divide by 2, 1 half. Okay, and so where is the sine of x equal to negative 1 half? Well, you've got the sine equals negative 1 half down here at 7 pi over 6 and at 11 pi over 6. Okay, so x is equal to 7 pi over 6 or 11 pi over 6. That takes care of this one. What about over here? Sine of x minus 2 equals 0. Well, that's going to be where sine of x equals 2. And when, uh, for what values of x can I, what, what values of x can I plug in to get sine of x equals 2? Kind of a trick question, right? Because there are none, right? There are none. There is no x. There is no x such that sine of x equals 2, right? So there's no solution over here at all, right? So that means the solution set is entirely captured by this scenario. Like this will never be 0. This can equal 0, okay? And so the solutions are x equals 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. Okay, does that make sense? <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at another example. What about something like this? What about sine of x, cosine of x equals 1 half? Uh, again, for 0 less than or equal to x less than 2 pi. Well, this one is kind of a kind of a funny one. Okay, so let's uh, let's see what we can see here. So if I start with sine x cos x equals a half, then that's the same thing as. 2 sine x cos x equals 1. Okay. And so what we can do is we can say, well, sine of 2x equals 1, then sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1. Uh, and that implies that the 2x needs to equal pi over 2, 
right? Which implies that 2x is equal to pi over 2 plus uh, 2 pi times n. Okay, so hopefully, I'm sorry, maybe keep in mind here, I guess I might skip that. This right here, where did this come from? This is just the double angle formula. This is an identity. This is the double angle formula. Okay, I might have, might have done that too quickly. <clears throat> Right, so you, you start here, you do a little bit of work, and you say, oh, this is the double angle formula. I can plug this in as a double angle. Uh, and then when you do that, uh, remember what you, you end up with, you know, a situation where you've got a multiple angle here. And so remember how to treat that is you think of just sine of x equals 1. And that's where we say sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1. So then I set my 2x equal to pi over 2, and I can see that x needs to be equal to pi over well, let's do it slower. Well, I'll slow it down a little bit here. Pi over 2 plus 2 pi n, right? And so that implies that x is equal to pi over 4 plus pi over n. OK? OK? And so we can, we can plug in a few values here. Right, we can plug in a few values to fit to make sure that we're inside of this range. So if I plug in n equals zero, I get x equals pi over four plus zero. Right, so that's just pi over four. That one's in. What about n equals one? I get x equals pi over four plus um, pi, and that's five pi over four. But n equals 2. I get x equals pi over 4 plus 2 pi. Well, that one's too big, isn't it? Right, so this one is too big. And so the, the answers, the solutions, are just x equals pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. Just those two. All right. Okay, so that was kind of a, a tricky one that used the double angle formula and using a trig identity. Okay, and let's do just one more quick one here. Just one more quick one. Okay, so we'll say we want to solve sine of x minus cosine of x equals 1 and 0 less than or equal to x less than 2 pi. Okay, And so what can we do here? This one is, you know, one of the things we can do is we can start by, you know, let's write the equation here and let's square both sides. Right, because I got a 1 over here, so if I square this, this side doesn't change at all. Okay, and so when I do that, I get, now this is going to expand a lot, so I get sine squared x minus 2 cos x sine x and then plus cos squared x. Okay, and I've got the sine squared x and the cos squared x, and so I can combine those to get just one. So let me rewrite it sine squared x plus cos squared x minus 2 cos x sine x equals 1. So that means this is just a 1 now. And so I get 1 minus 2 cos x sine x equals 1. And then the nice thing here is that the 1s will drop out. So if I subtract 1 from both sides, then they both disappear. So I get negative 2 cos x sine x equals 0. And that really makes it super simple because that's just cos x sine x equals 0. Right? Divide both sides by negative 2. And so now I just have to think about where is cos x 0 and where is sine x equal to 0. So cos x will take first. That happens at x equals 0 or pi. What about the sine? Sine is equal to 0 at the midway points here. So it'd be pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. All right, and so the solutions are 
0, pi over 2, pi, and 3 pi over 2. So those are all the places where uh, this equation here, sine x minus cos x equals 1, that's, that's, these, are the, these are the angles that produce a true statement here. Okay. All right. Well, I think we'll leave it there. And then when we come back, we're going to be shifting gears a little bit and starting to focus on solving more complex triangles. Uh, and so we'll get into the law of sines and the law of cosines and some other items. So we'll leave it there and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you all later. Take care.